And because he is, I am. Because he died, I live. Because if he had not seen anyone else in need, he would have died for me. And for that reason, I praise him, I honor him, I glorify him. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to stand in this holy place called St. Joe behind this holy desk where so many whom I have admired over the years have stood and have been presented the opportunity of being the proclaimers of a holy word. This morning I recognize with exceptional privilege to be able to preach where presiding elder and Mrs. Conrad Pridgen are in attendance. Um, the presiding elder here in the Western North Carolina Conference. I rec yeah. I recognize with favor all of these officers who have come and persons of great reputation and productivity throughout the conference in their various levels of leadership, how grateful I am that you slipped away for this early service. I pray you safe travel back before your pastors miss you and don't expect me to be your witness as to where you were. All of you, I know you by name and by fellowship and relationship. I am most happy to be able to express appreciation to these Reverend clergy who play such a vital role in this ministry. The prayers and the leadership and worship were noted and how grateful I am because those who don't recognize it, it's a special person who takes the second seat. And so often you are not given the kind of recognition that both of you deserve. And I am most appreciative because many hands, many hands make for little work. And I know you're holding up the arms of this ministerial leadership at this appointed time means a lot. I'm grateful that a part of our traveling entourage, uh, and that's the three musketeers. Um, we thank God for Miss Benjamin who makes our load lighter. Uh, I spoke to presiding elder Pridgen this morning and he was asking, how was I? And I said, I'm tired, man. I got enough sense now to recognize I'm tired. Miss Benjamin makes it easier for she keeps these things together so I'm not hopping all over the four areas. Uh, but she puts all of this stuff together and say I'll wear you out one good week and give you one good week off. <laughs> and so I'm grateful for her leadership and contribution. I am always happy to have my, my partner in mission and marriage of now going on and working towards 40 and six years. <laughs> and uh, 49 years we have known each other. And um, when I was just a young man, When I was just a young man, my sweet potato in my sweet potato pie. How grateful I am for my partner, Aurelis. To the offices of this church and all others who have embraced leadership over the years, how grateful I am to St. Joe. And I express on behalf of the whole of the denomination a heartfelt thank you 
for being who you are and for what you are often doing and what you're still doing and what you will do. Uh, I am most appreciative for your level of support, both prayerful support and financial support towards the solving of one of our problems, and that is the reduction of the general budget, which I do believe in my heart is going to ultimately, if we don't find a resolution for it, put us out of business. And for you to help us to find another way of doing it through ERT and making the sacrifice on the front end as opposed to the back end, how grateful I am to you. You are to be commended. To all of those persons who have served us this morning and worship, this is this choir and these musicians are something. I, I say in jest, for my appreciation, I listened to that piano, and that piano had two different emotions going on. One, it was saying, ouch, and the other one, it was saying, thank you. Ouch, because that brother was laying down on it. Thank you, because that piano was saying, I didn't know I had that in me. So, on behalf of the piano, Thank you. And the backup with all of those who helped to make music more than a joyful noise. Thanks for the choir and the ushers and the sound technician and all of others who have worked to make this experience an experience. I saved your pastor for last. And Sister Michelle, because it gives me an opportunity officially to say, Welcome to the hood. <laughs> I, I, uh, I welcome you. I welcome you, proudly welcome you to the second district. St. Joe has experienced outstanding leadership over the years. And the Augustines, this is their season. And I pray and hope that you will embrace as you have shown signs of doing thus far, this new day with new leadership. He is a brother who has distinguished himself as an attorney, a fraternal spirit, master pastor, one who is truly an articulator, and a brother who has shown himself to be a brother with integrity. I praise God for the fact that we are a church that's a member of a bigger family. And when we start trying to make our family small is when we die. And how grateful I am that our families extend all over the world. And uh, and I'm proud to be associated with, with people like your pastor. I feel, like, um, I feel like the makers of Hallmark. You know, I care enough about you to send you our very best. Now, on to the task at hand. I know your names, and I won't embarrass you by calling them, but we have relationships throughout this church. Some of them have moved on to Atlanta and other places. Some of them have gone on to glory. And so St. Joe is not a new fellowship for me. It is one that I remember fondly. Shall we bow? Shall we pray? And uh, first, I need you to smile. And I assure you, if you, uh, if you just look up here and look like you're halfway interested, <laughs> I, I can be through with this thing right quick and in a hurry. Uh, one thing Miss Benjamin did not tell me, I was preaching twice today. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, 
shall we bow, shall we pray. Consecrate us to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let our souls look up with steadfast hope and our wills be lost in thine. Jesus, we love you. Oh, yes, we love you. We love you. Forgive us when we fail to show it like you want to receive it. But do know our hearts cry out, we love you. So bless us now with directions on how to love you more, how to love you better, how to show our love in a way in which you is acceptable in your presence. This is our hope as the word goes forth that it might fall on fertile ground, that in so doing someone might believe and in believing be saved. Being saved, live like a saved person ought. This is our prayer. This is our hope. We claim it. And all the brothers and sisters under the sound of my voice will show agreement if you can by saying amen. amen. There's a word that's found in our Lord's gospel as recorded by the gospel secretary, St. John. The second chapter, beginning with the first verse and reading through through to the 11th verse, John 2, 1 through 11. I'm reading from the new revised version, a translation, and there you'll find these words. They are not unfamiliar with you. You have heard them more than many times if you have gone to Sunday school or passed by Bible study. It's one that we have grown up on, but I think that we find a deeper meaning in them today. On the third day, a wedding took place in Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine. Woman, why do you involve me in such things? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding for from 20 to 30 gallons of water. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been drawn and turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servant who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, come here, that's my input. Everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have too much to drink. But you, you, you've saved the best stuff. That's my input. Until now, what Jesus did here in Galilee of Ga Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed even more on him. I want to preach from the subject this morning and you might answer the question if you choose to, but I hope before we have finished to offer some suggestions that you might consider. The subject title this morning, what do you do when your wine runs out? What, what do you, you party animals? What, what, what do you do? 
you fraternity brothers. <laughs> what, what, what do you do when your wine runs out? Many of the deeper meanings of the miracles of Jesus are often missed because the participants in them and the witnessing that we give after them, we often get so excited about the surroundings of the actions and activities of the Christ until we miss what deeper meanings they may have. We too can, at times, without even knowing it, find ourselves so preoccupied with what goes on even on Sunday morning until we can miss the deeper meanings of the message that comes across. You don't believe it? Check somebody out one of these days, not after hearing this sermon, but next Sunday when you hear the other one. <laughs> Ask them, what did the preacher preach about? If they happen to tell you, I don't know, but it was good then you would know then that they have been guilty of missing the deeper message. Concerned with the sound or the presentation, the enunciation, the vocabulary, but failing to receive the message that God has for us. It is likened to getting into a new car and getting so carried away with the brand, the make, the details, until actually you never crank up the car and you never are allowed or allow the car to do what the car was supposed to do. The car was supposed to carry you from one place to another. And you get carried away with the sound of the engine. You get carried away with the look of the car. You get carried away with the sound of the radio until you fail to understand the deeper purpose that the car was supposed to have. The Bible in this 11th 11th verse of the second chapter, in these 11 verses, this was the beginning of the miracles of Jesus. This was the start of his earthly ministry in so many ways. Jesus was making his debut as who he was and how he was going to present himself. It took place at Canaan of Galilee near Nazareth, a wedding. It was the occasion for this particular setting of his miracle. In Palestine, a wedding was really a, no a notable occasion. Not unlike what we do even now, for weddings are special even now. Uh, the only thing different now, they say that if you really want to start a family fight, get a funeral, get a wedding, get a family reunion. The Jew, Jewish law demand that the wedding of a virgin should take place on a Wednesday. This is of interest to us because it gives us the date from which uh, to work back. And if the wedding took place on Wednesday, it must have been the Sabbath day when Jesus first met Andrew and John and they stayed the whole day with him. Unlike many of the weddings now, the weddings generally had... Uh, preoccupied themselves in the preparation of such in celebrating some seven days before the wedding actually took place. Now you've got to understand, they were like an atypical of many of our wedding settings too in celebration. Celebration called for, well, you know what they calls for. In most cases, but they were in the business of starting the celebration, the festivities, the joy, the drinking of the wine began seven days prior to the wedding's actual culmination. Now, don't get worried. I'm not trying to introduce the whole idea of people who are around drunk the whole time, for, for they believe in sobriety to the point that they often mix water and wine together. It was a social event and they took advantage of the fact of being together in harmony. After the celebration, the young couple was, was um, actually escorted to their new home. They weren't even allowed to go on their honeymoon by themselves initially. That was some kind of wedding back then. <laughs> they were led through the streets 
by the longest route possible so that everyone would have an opportunity to see them. And they would be carried, and others would carry torches and canopies over them. Not unlike some of the weddings that my wife describes took place in her own hometown, uh, the opportunity for people to cast an oil blessing upon the couple was the intent of the celebration. Somehow we ought to get back to making sure that while we're celebrating, we ought to cast a blessing, especially with three out of every five marriages ending in divorce. Somebody needs to get back to casting a blessing on the married couples. It was a marriage and a wedding was a big deal. Can you agree to that? It was a big deal. This was surely a special wedding for several reasons because Mary was there, uh, but more particularly and primarily because Jesus was on the invitation list. Now, I'm not sure whether the other boys were on the invitation list, but they just hung out with Jesus, so they went on and crashed the party anyway. His presence at the wedding ordained the marriage, and even now, as we go through several ceremonies of wedding bliss, we never forget to announce the fact because Jesus was there, we now ordain the process of marriage. So marriage is not something that just happens. Marriage is something that's ordained of God. Mary, the mother of Jesus, must have been had an important role in this organization of the preparation of the wedding. We know this because when things start jumping off, when problems began to happen, when everything became problematic, it was Mary, Jesus' mother. It was Mary. It, she took it upon herself to get involved in making the corrections to the situation. Do you not? Be, are you not able to see how Mary's role in this thing must have been because of her kinship to uh, the married couple's mother. Uh, it must have been because she had a special relationship of some kind with someone involved in the wedding process. One of the Coptic Gospels tells us that Mary was a sister to the bridegroom's mother. Auntie was there. Thank God for Auntie who was there to straighten this thing out. The embarrassing thing that happened, in the midst of everything else, the wine had run out. The, ga the, 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 the guess was there. The wine had run out. For the Jewish festivals and the Jewish feasts, wine was essential. It, it was not just an add-on. Understand, if you didn't have wine at a festival then, it was not considered proper it was not considered uh, to really be as effectual as it was supposed. Wine was essential in the wedding ceremonies. Yeah. Without wine, the rabbis said there is no joy, so wine represented for them joy. It was not the people that they were drunk or anything, but wine was part of the celebration and the festivity that uh, the opportunity of saying to everybody around here, we are happy. Drunkenness was not a fact. It was a disgrace. And they, they did not, I'm not trying to express the fact that they believed that, but because they mixed it, as I said before, and composed the wine with water. At any time, the failure of provisions would have been a problem, but for hospitality in the Middle East, it was a sacred duty always to have enough in the house. Well, you know how it is. Wouldn't it be something if somebody came to your house for dinner and you ran out of food? One of the worst, if you will allow me to, to, to just pause long enough to in, inject one of my own personal stories, one of the worst things that happened when I was growing up, there were 13 of us and my father, 13 children, and my father would not accept invitations uh, from church members because if one of us went, all of us was going. And so that was a family of 15. Date that. <laughs> There was a lady by the name of Miss Crump 
who owned a little corner deli, and uh, for whatever reason or not, Daddy did not get out of going to dinner with her, and Mama agreed that we would go, but on that Sunday morning, are you still listening to me? Yeah. On that Sunday morning, Mama got all of us together as we were piling into three cars, getting ready to go to church, and after church, before church started, before we left the house, Mama gave us all of our instructions. We're going, which was an which was an unusual thing for us to be going to somebody's dinner. Mama had already prepared dinner at home and like she was supposed to on Saturday night. All of us had helped her to prepare it because we were supposed to be eating like always. Mama said to all of us, he said, now we're going to Miss Crump's home. Now, if she asks you if you want anything else, you tell her, no, thank you, you're full. Mind your manners. Don't eat too much. Understand that lady doesn't have much. Well, we got there at the table, at three tables, in fact. It was just the younger ones of us sitting at the table with my mother and father, unfortunately. <laughs> my youngest brother, who was there when Miss Crump, Miss Crump had a meal prepared for us, I remember it like it was yesterday. Chicken, chicken dumplings, collard greens, potato, sweet potatoes. But oh, she had a meal. Get hungry just thinking about what she had on the table then. <laughs> After dinner, as dinner was progressing, she went around the table and said to each one of us at the table, Do, did you have enough to eat, son? Everybody did what mother told them to do. <laughs> yes, we had enough. We are full. We had enough. We got to, down to Leon right before me. Thank God there was a brother right before me. <laughs> got to Leon, my youngest brother, who's older than I was, but Leon told the truth. He went on to say that, no ma'am, I'm not full. <laughs> but mama told us not to get any more food <laughs> because you didn't have much. <laughs> mama can commenced to kicking Leon under the table. Leon wouldn't shut up. Mama yanked across the table. Daddy came to Leon's defense and said, honey, don't do that. You did tell him that. Oh, mama was ready to get daddy then. <laughs> the story ends. Leon was not killed at the table, and I want to let you know that. He was not killed at home though I think he wished he had been. <laughs> but the lady went on to the deli up the street, came back from the deli, her deli, with all of this food there, and we ate, and we ate, and we ate. And Leon was the only one who lost his appetite. <laughs> it was that kind of setting that I want you to picture. It was necessary to have wine there because it was acceptable and you just didn't run out of wine. Let me go on the next five minutes now and finish this sermon because the sermon does have a purpose. Here it is. Mary comes to Jesus and says to him, I, I need to tell you something, boy. Jesus, they have run out of wine. They have run out of wine. Now the proposal to you today is this. It's not the wine that I'm talking about. I'm talking about what wine stood for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wine for them stood for joy. When, when you run out of your joy, what do you do? When, when you run out of the basic stuff that you know you have to have in order to get up in the morning, what do you do? When you run out of the fortitude and the faith that you need in order to put one feet out of the bed and the other is reluctant to follow you because you don't know what's going to happen the next time you get up, what do you do? When you run out of the faith that causes you to know that even though the doctor says that you it's uncurable, what do you do when you run out of wine? What do you do when you start running out of stuff that makes you want to 
keep your marriage together. And it's been so much hell in the house until you're just ready to give up. What do you do when you when you run out of wine? I can't name your wine for you. But, but what do you do when you run out of the stuff that you know you got to have in order to face the tomorrows? Maslow talks about hierarchy of needs, but what do you do when that's just not enough to satisfy you? What, what, what do you do when you just don't know what to do? When you, when, you, when you reach a point that you cannot go any further, what do you do when you run out of wine? Some folk would go and tell the doctor and the doctor would prescribe anti-depression medicine. Some folk would turn to illicit behavior. Some folk would just give up. But what do you do? Hmm? Huh? 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 Have you ever found yourself? Have you ever found yourself in a place that you had to do something you couldn't go forward because you you just didn't see it. You couldn't go backwards because you knew what was back there. You couldn't go sideways because there was no room that was prepared for you. What do you do when you don't know? What, what, what did you do in 208 when the down, the turn of the economy, when the loans were upside down and you were getting ready for retirement? What, what do you do? What, what do you do? Uh, well... You, you, do you know, want to know what you ought to do? I'm glad you asked. You asked the right somebody, and I got four minutes to tell you the three things that Mary taught me. Aren't you interested? I, I am too. Mary says that if you find yourself at a point of your wine running out and you don't know what to do, this is what you do. Mary immediately, as a result of noticing the wine was out, turned to Jesus with confidence. Mm -hmm. Did, didn't, didn't hesitate. He, he could talk about that stuff about my time has not come yet if he wanted to. But mama, mama knows that I, I, I don't know what to do. So what I'm going to do is what I know how to do. I'm, I'm going to turn to you. And I'm going to turn to you knowing that if anybody can do anything about it, you can. I, I'm going to turn with confidence to Jesus. I'm, I, 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 no, 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 I'm not going to call my neighbor. I, no, I'm not going to call my friends. No, I'm not going to put it on Facebook. I'm, I'm going to turn to Jesus. I, I'm going to turn to him. I'm going to turn to him. I'm going to turn to him with the confidence and knowing that if there's an answer, he has it. Yeah. Now, now you got to understand in order to turn with that kind of confidence, you, you have to have a relationship before you start turning. <laughs> you, don't, you don't come and ask me for a loan and, and you haven't spoken to me all year long. <laughs> you, 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 don't, you don't come asking me for a hookup and, and you never call me all year. You, you don't come asking me for a healing and I never hear from you all 365 days a week and you never call my name. You, you've got to have a relationship with me. You, you've got to spend some time. You, I've got to know. I've got to know we got it going on like that. Oh, that's one minute. The, the, second, the second point is this. First, when your wine runs out, turn. Now, I know y'all are quiet congregation, but y'all can help me help a brother out. <laughs> uh, 
the first thing you do is turn to, don't be ashamed of his name. And those who may not have a relationship right now, get one. Turn to Jesus for the hookup. The second thing Mary showed us, she said to the brothers dealing with the problem, now I've already got the hookup for you. Now what you need to do is whatever he says, you, you didn't even get it. Whatever he says, you do. You, you didn't get it. You, 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 you couldn't have gotten that. Uh, don't, 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 try to, don't try to solve it by yourself. Uh, you do what he says. You, you, he, he won't operate in your program. You, you've got to be willing to do what he says. He, he won't come and do it your way on your timetable. You, you've, got to, you've got to be willing to do just what he says. And it does not make sense all the time. It does not add up. It does not equate. It does not fit into my model. But do whatever. Do whatever. Do whatever. Do I? No, it just doesn't. The doctor says I'm in stage four. But he says you are healed. By my stripes you are. If I tithe, I can't pay. Do what he says. Bring ye your tithe into my store. Do what he says. Second minute. Third minute is this, and I'm through. When you... When you call, turn to Jesus, and you do what he says. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, this, this, this is not a Duke sermon. <laughs> I just got it out of the scripture. Oh, turn to Jesus, do what he says, and, and now... Expect, um, expect, expect the best stuff yes, yeah, yeah. to happen. Uh -huh. okay, okay. They, they, they took it to the master of the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, the master said, this is uh, that other stuff you've been serving was that that was that was that was that was boom farm. <laughs> and mad dog. That's red label. Lord have mercy, Jesus. I want you to know I did my research for that. I, I, I'm not a proponent of the stuff myself. <laughs> but but what you just brought. That's age shabli. Uh, what, what you what you just brought what was a was tastes like it had been sitting and aging for a whole year. What what you just brought was good stuff. You 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 managed to save the best stuff to last. And I, I want to close out by just saying, if you turn to him and if you do what he says, he'll make sure that your best days are in front of you, not behind you. I woke up this morning and he blew my mind. My best days are not behind me. My best days. What do you do? Your best days are yet to come.